So, um, let's go around the table and just have a sort of high-level snapshot for my benefit of everyone else's, where the major subsystems are. James, main control. Well, we've been working on the order flip-flops for a number of weeks and have ended up with um, a list of requirements which they need to conform to. These are the flashing units, yes. are they? Yes. Yeah. And um, we've been liaising with John. The flashing units, the monostables, are uh, complicated in their behaviour. <laughs> um, but Tom and Simon have done in-depth studies and um, they feel confident that uh, they can be made to work and give us all the uh, behaviours that we need. There's an issue with noisy signals from EDZAC leaking through AND gates for the set signal and those have to be cleaned up. Right. Um, then there's an issue with how long you have to wait until you can set the flip-flop again after a reset. But we're talking with John in detail yeah. about the exact requirement there. It seems that we do have a period of grace during which uh, John is seeking the next order. And there's a, there's a minimum, at least two minor cycles, isn't there? there? So, and could be a lot longer because it, it, uh, it depends where the order is in the tank. Yeah. But the minimum is two. Okay. Minus on, on the next iteration round, we can bore you yeah. all for as yeah. long as you want with the details of this. Stuff. So we have so, we so. have a we have a list of eleven requirements, which I think define what's needed, and then Tom and Simon will produce electronics that meet that. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm off to India. No. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have, we'll have a drill down on that once we've done the table. We can do ten, but oh, in fact, we can do all eleven of them, but not all eleven simultaneously. We can get right. ten, but there's one yeah. missing. <laughs> However, there's a, there's a kind of broader, deeper question. Um, the monostables are not easy to work with. Their behaviour is a bit cranky. <laughs> and then, then Tom says no. <laughs> and then we, I, I, I did a survey of the historical diagrams uh, that were found and by 1952 quite a number of the flip-flops on, on those collection of diagrams that we have and we don't know that that, that is a representative sample yeah. we don't know what, what kind of sample it is um, the great majority uh, of flip-flops had been uh, changed to bi-stables we don't know that they were monostables to begin with but Certainly by 1952, they're shown as bi-stables. Now, whether that's because um, they felt those were more reliable or easier to work with, I don't know. So there is that kind of question. Okay. If we continue to have difficulties with monostables, if um, there is that possible option of changing them to bi-stables. But the bystable that's in the documentation, the historical diagrams, does rely on a minus 200 volt rail to bias the grids. That's to force one of the valves off strongly. Um, Tom and I have produced a bystable for the operator's control unit, which doesn't need the minus 200 volt rail. It achieves the biasing by raising the cathode with a bias, so okay. that, that, that there is a relative grid to cathode bias to force one of the valves off. Um, anyway, that long ramble. Is, 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 the question is, if we if we were to continue having difficulties with monostables, then we might not. Um, it may raise the question of rethinking some, at least, of the monostables. Okay, so let's put that on the agenda for deeper discussion when we've, yeah. we've gone round the table. Yeah. Okay, thanks James. John, anything well, from well, coincidence? Well, the coincidence access? unit is fully working as far as I'm concerned. It's sitting there waiting to be used, i.e. to be stipulated from the main control. Um, having it running in various modes, either 
sitting at address zero or turning you up through the various addresses. <coughs> um, so I think I'd say that's complete. Good. Finished. It uses monostables, as James has just been talking about, but I haven't observed any problems, mainly because of the patterns in which they set and reset. Um, in doing that, I've also cleaned up the main characters and the sequence character, and I've now attached the revised main clock distribution, clock six, uh, which wasn't working very well beforehand, and that is now working correctly with the characters and main characters. Um, so I'm happy that that side too is fairly stable. One interesting thing I've observed in doing that is that Whilst initially I looked at the clock distribution and said that's not right in terms of the biasing, when it was attached to the counter actually it all came out in the wash and it was correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware of any documentation which says this but basically if you take a clock waveform which is 50-50 on off and let the average sink down as it will do, the effect of this is it cuts off the driver which means the output voltage is lower which means the gating condition in the other is more balanced. Right. So it all works a lot better. If you look at the individual parts, you say that's not right, but if you put it all together, it works. So, <laughs> and it works better. <laughs> so I've learned something there. Right. <laughs> now, the same comment does not apply to the digital pulses, right? It's only the main clock distribution. Yeah, that that actually, because because of the 50 50 yeah. waveform, right. lets the output driver sink down, which means effectively the output driver is completely cut off for all 40% of the time, which means the load is completely driven by the cathode resistor. And all the effects we get from using air 55s with higher bias voltages just disappear because it's cut off. Right. So that's a big plus. Yes. We did it right first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they did it right, and we've we've learnt why. Yes. Um, yeah. So good. But having said that, the digipulse generators, which James is using to try and gate them, and I use them also, are dangerous in the sense of their E fifty fives. And so, if you try and gate them with an E fifty four, it's the old problem of the different voltage levels. Right. And uh, we have to be very conscious of that, and uh, if necessary, buffer the uh, digit pulses with an AF54. Oh, right. right. Okay. Point taken. Yeah. yeah. So I'd say very often the rest of my time I've held hands. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing I'll come in at less is very um, <coughs> conveniently taken over the putting the wires on the store address racks. Um, all the various wire links, just sheer physical effort of putting it all together. Which leads yeah. me to jump in. Yeah. I've bought, um, I've made some more and bought them with me this trip. Um, the Paxlin strips that go on the gantry. I noticed a couple of split oh, yeah. and so forth. So there are some spares, um, but they are quite fragile. One needs to be a bit yeah. delicate. I was talking really. more about the in inter panel yeah. oh, okay. connections, um, which is the one that's at the yeah. top with the wires wrapped around the intra yeah. rack connection. Yeah. Yes. So it, <laughs> yes. It's R4, R4. Uh, or two, or two. You've completely put them in now, yeah. 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 But the front ones, the just the physical effort of making all the connections up and putting them all in. Excellent. So yeah. now the panel ones are all full of working. <laughs> so we can pull the wiring in. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and can we put in the second <coughs> yeah. screws? So are they all properly attached in as well? Uh, yeah, I might be premature, but. <laughs> 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 yeah. You think it will change the electrical characteristics <laughs> of the string? Just one small issue. <laughs> which we discussed with Liz is how often are we going to take the panel ones out for maintenance and so we need to plan ahead and make sure we can take one out without disturbing all the wiring yes <laughs> yeah it just makes life easier in there if you yeah. plan the way you connect the wires together on the tags okay if you, you want to take anything out you want the minimum disturbance yeah okay so right now shall see the ones um on your gun chart, you've got an activity saying connect the new physical tanks, not the emulators, in to the characters. I'm ready to do that. Um, just needs the actual units to be put in the right place yep. and okay. physically plugged in. Yeah, that's a test we could do quite quickly. 
Okay, so Peter Linnington will be here, he's arriving a bit later, he's yeah. going to come by train, he can't drive at the moment, so, that's, uh, so we can schedule that. Yeah. That's the next thing to do, is simply get, get hold of the units, switch them on. Okay, that's Cross excellent. Papers. Very good. <laughs> right, well, Very good. No problem. Okay, so Les, right. Chassis ones and memory system. Yes, all the long tanks have been checked and brought to the latest modification states, and... Uh, We've done about five or six iterations in each unit, and uh, they've been switching on satisfactorily now, so we've left that. I offered our services to John a few, um, few month, about a month ago, yeah, yeah. whereby we took over the, um, yeah. the rank decoding, distribution, and logic circuitry. We've modified our old, our trusty HN generator to actually allow us to, um, to exercise the, all this, the system within each rack so we can uh, establish whether it's working or not. Um, work has commenced on that and R2 is now completely wired up, complete both with tank switching and input-output terminations on the JS1P type connectors. The coaxial cable for tank switching, as I say, has been installed where it's been pulled in. There is some cabling outstanding for F1 and F2, which I believe you didn't get round to doing the last time. You've done the TS, but not the input-output. Okay. That's something Alex and I will need to pick up. Then. Okay. I, I, I thought we thought we had done it all. No. <laughs> okay. Bam. Because that means I'm doing things. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, as I say, the, the TS is, and I've started, I've started terminating that on F1. If you can send me an email of what's missing, okay. and Alex and I will synchronise and right. come and crawl around the gantries and do it. It would seem to be the Project High Wire Act. <laughs> and aside, <laughs> aside from a few other bits and pieces, uh, that's the truncated version or the pressing version. And, right. uh, Excellent. That's, that's all very good progress. And thank you to you and your team for taking a quarter of the machine and uh, bashing it into shape. It's been quite a long haul. Anything you want to add that's been said, Tom, or on? You've, you've been thinking about updating your test box. Um, well, the, the only thing I did on Tuesday was um, generate a uh, sequence that we can generate test pulses for the flip-flop. Um, so we can stress test the flip-flop such that we can send a stream of uh, reset pulses in between set pulses and just change the wires around from between set and reset. And So you stress test it between, send it a strat string of reset pulses uh, between set pulses right. and, and okay. vice versa. So. It's just to try and bottom out the limits of what the flip flop capability is. Right. But then talking to John this morning in the pre meeting meeting, um, the question needs to be really um, what is the time delay between when we get the end pulse? Does the, or does the order information disappear? And then when do we get the new order information? Right. So that's something that we've, we've been discussing with James and John. Okay. That's it, really. Good. So your test box is becoming a universal tester. So <laughs> you're testing, you reprogram it away we go, which is great, useful piece of kit. Nigel, anything to say apart from we've been driving backwards and forwards? Well, I mean, the ALU is all working. <laughs> uh, it isn't now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst we all drove incredibly carefully, uh, when we put the stuff on the rack, I did notice quite a few of the valves were well separated from the sockets. So, um, and it doesn't have any power yet, so that that we know that needs to be done, that's the next step. But you, you want a historic account of what's done recently. The, uh, two things that might have some bearing on, on what James was saying. Um, doing the multiplication, it takes about five milliseconds. I noticed that the, some of the gating pulses from flip-flops that I was using you know, were drooping a bit towards the end. So believing that you should have a bit of welly, Basically, the simple expedient of changing the coupling capacitors from 10 to 100 nanofarads has given them a good, you know, holds them up for longer. Retrospectively, I went back to the shift controller as well, which has to decode C5 and 6 to decide that's left or right shift. Um, again, that has to provide a, a stable gate, a decoded gate. Uh, to the shifter unit, and that was drooping a bit, so I just changed those to 100 nanofarads, and I've got pretty square yeah. gating square. signals now, yeah. so a yeah, very simple solution. Okay, so what, was, what, what was the first thing you changed? You changed the cathode? It was in the you know, the um, coupling capacitors in the 
What do we actually call that one? The out, is, is, it, it, is it the, is the output stage? The, to the out, the 55 output stage or to the between the <coughs> No, two we don't use 55s, it's, it's 54s. So in this case, it was um, deciding at the end of the multiplication, um, yeah, at the end of the multiplication, no, rewind, at the beginning of the multiplication, um, four signals get set up which determine <coughs> whether you're going to complement the thing coming, the, the number coming through the um, unit or leave it alone. Equally, at the end of the multiplication, you look at a sign bit and say, oh, you better invert that. And so you've got this, this four wire coded signal at the beginning and the end. Yeah. They all fade away to zero when, when you're not doing multiply. Yeah. So it's actually in the unit called CC. U8 multiplication or 57 in the project ID. So <clears throat> that was that one, and the other one was the shift. And you, and you changed precedence from what? From 10, the, the conventional 10. So on an AND gate, the output of these four AND gates here, for example, which would normally have a 10 nanofarad into a meg, uh, 100 nan nanofarads into a meg, and they, beautiful. Right. You're talking about the coupling between the flip flop and the um, inverter or whatever you call it. Yeah, that's on. To do with the monostable. That, yeah. that's on. No, that's Cut on the course. other ones because what you've got coming out of here, uh, out of the flip flop, you've got an inverter as well. So mm. if the f you get always get two signals out, and that, that's what's being decoded along with, excuse me, the inputs. So they are actually coming. One's coming. You're right. N none of the valves are actually. Uh, concerned are actually flip flop valves, they're the immediate stage afterwards. Right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry if I misled you there. Um, the other thing of note, as I took the and disconnected all the racks, I photographed them all. For, and the reason is quite simple if someone in the future is going, I say, Oh, yes, um, VR3. Well, there's six VRs there, which there is on one chassis. Where are they? <laughs> so, all, every chassis is documented like that, and all the major components, like the delay lines and the variable resistors, are numbered. So, you know, anyone Very looking good. for something will know. Yeah, you, the, probably, you probably can't see it looking round the I table, but I'm sorry, I passed them round. Yeah, yeah. Physically, it was done by you, you just got some magnetic numbers. Fridge magnets, basically, and put those in the chassis next to the parts. Yeah. So that was the okay. chassis. All yeah, the DLs, yeah. Eileen made up by getting a magnetic things from our Sasco planner and a Dymo labeler and just did some <laughs> stuck the Dymo yeah. labeler. Yeah, and I had to supplement the magnetic with a bit of double-sided tape on some because they don't stick to the delay line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Funny, that. <laughs> yeah, must have used copper wire. Yeah. <laughs> So that's something that uh, others might want to think about as they uh, document their world. Anyway, that's all basically. I mean, it's, things have slowed down a bit, which is good. Yeah. Two I'm racks are out in the weather now, so I, I can walk I around. I did start using a black lead on the on the chassis metal once. So, <laughs> but simply use a black pencil. Yeah, no, I've already done metal, that. It works quite well. Yeah, but it's not really visible because um, that's, <laughs> that's what I've got that they are on there. Mm. But. Um, you have to write them upside down the way I was doing. So that's 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 much. There are markings there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's this number? <laughs> okay, Peter. Any, anything to say? Clock, um, digit, pulses, initial orders. Really, is our territory uh, at the moment, isn't right. it? Initial orders coming first. Okay, that sounds like uh, a good idea. We had a meeting two weeks ago. Yes. Discuss uh, the initial orders logic. And came up with one or two conclusions, which I'm now sort of tried to incorporate into design. Which is, uh, if you remember the previous one, it, it was rather com more complicated than this, so we're, we're making progress and simplifying it. Yeah. Um, helped by John realizing that you can use one level in the user sector, unit selector, for two different purposes, as long as you don't don't want to do them both at the same time. Yeah. That takes me back a year or two. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yes. I think it's one of the lessons that keeps coming home to me, because this yes. is the group I'm working with closely, is 
in a serial machine, the logic only has to work at the point where something interesting is going on for that bit of the logic, and the rest of the time it can wave around in the breeze doing what it likes. Uh, and this is so not how you think with modern parallel hardware. That, yeah. uh, it's, uh, <coughs> you end up over-designing to cover cases that it doesn't actually yeah. matter what's happening. I mean, if, if John were here, I would be giving him this, saying, yeah, build that. Very good. <laughs> but um, he isn't, so I have to email it to him. Is it Norwich, or has to email it to him? Very good. Yeah. Okay, so that's all very good. Um, and as far as you and here are concerned, the whole clock digit system is now essentially it's, it's now stable. It, is now how it should be. Now yes. how it should be, excellent. Having, having rewired all the digit pulses, as it were. Right. I've just executed an instruction. When am I likely to receive another instruction from the control unit? It's certainly not uh, 72 uh, microseconds. Right, it's right. You know, yeah. a few minor cycles. At best, if, if it happens, yeah. happens to Later. be available, you know, if it was a jump, <coughs> in the best case, the worst case, is if you have a succession of jumps yeah. that all satisfy mm. one another mm. and the yeah. instructions yeah. just right waiting, on top of each other. and then even doing that is, you know, it's still many, it's several uh, minor cycles, isn't it? Yeah. Between so instructions. Could get back. So. Yeah. So it could, could so be our, our assumption was yeah. perhaps a bit too um, demanding. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that's why I want. To raise that but that's, I, I still think there's a problem that, that those pulses are marginal for setting this and it yeah. might might be that just waiting 200 microseconds will not set that flip flop if that's the first yeah. pulse that you yeah. see we need to at least test that and be sure but we also need to take Nigel's point that after the AND gate you you have a cathode follower wow. yeah. yeah which which itself can be used to clip the noise out. Yeah, so and maybe so we're going to could be a simpler solution which yeah. Um, I wouldn't write direct connections to the, I, I think the flip-flops are delicate, we know, and, yeah. and they've been worked on for several years now, yeah. but I think I'm originally I remember sending Chris an email, the first flip-flop I in implemented, I said, it worked first time, Chris, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was only a You're transient like effect. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but what happened that in the I think situation? the instruction is repeated. Is repeated? Yeah. yeah, I think the instruction whizzes round and round until yeah. it... What, repeatedly outputting the stuff to the printer, which until latches, it gets latches, latches yeah. the... Because yeah. Yeah. the SCT, it stops the SCT moving on, so you keep executing this instruction. Oh, keep on executing the same yeah. instruction. So actually we're not waiting. I don't no, that's, that's, all, no. that's relatively all right then. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not an exact programming expert yet. <laughs> well, well, others are. Yeah, others yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are only 18 instructions. It doesn't take long to learn them. <laughs> and they say, yeah, and they changed it. There must be a worthwhile paper in this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there are, there are many little issues we found in building it that are worth recording in terms of, you know, that's what they built originally. Yeah. Oh dear, you know. Yes. He changed it. <laughs> yeah. And we now understand why. <laughs> yeah. why. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of the overall project, you may wish to have a phase two. Which improves it. Well, it Peter, well, we, we, we did a round table when we started, and obviously right. you, you couldn't be here because you have travel. Um, okay, well, the, um, the short delay lines seem to be working okay. The experiments with the cabling seem to be okay, although very sensitive to the cable layout. So the next step is to get the um, final cabling installed and do some more tests on that. Um, the next big step is to uh, produce prototypes of the final design of the long delay lines. And the, um, the drawings for that, met the metalwork for that have been produced and are currently with Tethersham, although there seems to be a slight hold up there. Um, the other thing to be done before we could do serious work on the um, coffin end wiring is to provide all the internal metalwork for the coffins, and I'm working on that. I've got drawings. I'm producing metalwork, although it be rather slowly at the moment. Um, and once we've done that, we can finish installing the wiring into the final locations and do some more um, commissioning tests to see what that's done to the noise pickup and uh, reliability. Uh, a quick, I am working on the clock monitor unit. Um, although you haven't seen much evidence of it, but here is evidence that I am working on it, and that wasn't set up. <laughs> it's been like that for months. Could be anything. <laughs> yeah. Could and be I'm anything. struggling to get a, a decent time base to work at this high speed, but uh, that's that's that that's the 
as far as my critical path is concerned, to get the, a decent time-based circuit, uh, then I can complete the rest of the circuitry, then I can design the metal work, and then we're motoring. But right. It's chugging along. So do, do we in the end agree what we're looking for on the screen to tell us that the clock is correctly set? Um, there's some between a line and a circle. <laughs> It'll be... <laughs> We, we may not have agreed it, but what it will be <laughs> um, is <coughs> both the uh, the chassis one pulse and the clock pulse superimposed in some way. They may be awed together so that you will see four edges. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, of the data going up, clock going up, clock coming down, data coming down, but that sort of thing. Right. Maybe the clock will be half amplitude, or I mean the sort of thing mm. we can adjust. Right. But it is a bit experimental. The sort of thing this modern day and age, you get the HCI expert into it. Well that's right, and we know <laughs> nothing about how the original was done, and Peter's test equipment it will be more precision anyway yeah. than, than this. Um, probably what's more relevant is what signal from the chassis one do we monitor? CP13. Great. Every, every time. It's the most, that's the most sensitive you want to look at for checking the alignment. Now that's the one that comes out on a new tank to, tank to come to the tank. Yeah. Yes. Um, Consequently, the looking at the thing in the rack, the, the, the clock monitor unit, um, which of the 32 chassis ones are we going to look at? You can look at all of them if you use TP13. So you can pick off where you want on the, on the test switch and uh, use that. But the switch, test switch is over there on the desk. Yeah. So the engineer setting the clock goes across there. Turns, can do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but is that what you would expect to work? And I then I want a signal from the switch, please, to come back to the middle, mm. to the XP. I, I would hardwire it on to um, uh, tank naught. Right. Because that's the one yeah. most likely to have code in it. Yes. Mm. And the, 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 the only precondition for being able to set it up is there's got to be some one pulses in there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. The, um, so the, the something which we can be sure the initial orders will put yeah. something in. There is a compromise that mm. I can have a four-way switch yeah. on the top monitor unit, which could pick up naught in one of three, four racks. Right. Yeah. So Say. we've got to set the delays up so that they are all the same Indeed, to remove yeah, what whatever picking picking precision we can so do. In a way so anyone will do. Yeah, you can't adjust the clock separately to, no. exactly. to match a different set of no, that's right. uh, no. memory units. They all have to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Peter, Peter's right. You get zero working, yeah. so you can inject a program, and then a program can comment on the ability of the rest of the store to live up to its name. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. This mm. isn't a commissioning aid, this box. It's, yeah. it's a thing for the maintenance. So, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm happy with that. Mm. Right. Haven't spoken to Martin Evans recently, so I can't give you an IO um, subsystem update. But he's not really on the critical path, and he seems fairly happy. Even though I meet him on engineering group every now and then, um, so I think that's progressing. Um, Peter will be here in a bit, so it sounds like reasonably good progress all round. Any questions on any of the summary stuff before we dive in? Good. Okay, I think that's where we are.